this is Anna with Folksy Tales, and today we are talking about a Japanese tale. I have seen this story referred to as both a fairy tale, a legend, and strangely enough, um, an early sci-fi story, but I will get into that at the end. This is the story of the bamboo cutter and the moon child. The original author of this story is unknown, as is the case for many, many of these types of stories. It is estimated to have originated in the 9th or 10th century, which was known as the Heian period of Japan. And it is the oldest known surviving monogatari, which is a type of traditional Japanese literature that is a long form narrative story. This type of story is similar in a way to an epic in that it's a long form version of a tale that is typically fantastical in some kind of way, either telling a fictional story or perhaps a highly embellished historical event. The oldest surviving manuscript for this tale dates to 1592. The story, The Bamboo Cutter and the Moon Child is a beautiful tale all about the strength of love, beauty, and living with whatever it is life has to throw at you. With that being said, once upon a time, there lived an old bamboo cutter and his wife. He worked hard every single day, going out to cut down bamboo, wrap it all up and bring it home so that he could make it into various household wares that he and his wife would sell. And that is how they made their living. His only regret in life was that, that he and his wife never had children, despite badly, badly wanting them. He felt like his life would just go on with every day being the same, working hard until eventually he died. One morning it happened that he went out, as he always did, and found an area to begin his work. Right before he began, a soft but bright glowing light spread throughout the area, and it seemed almost like the moon had come up directly above him. Looking around in amazement, the old bamboo cutter saw that this light was coming from one bamboo stalk. He walked over and as he got closer, he saw that it was coming from one hollow spot. There in the midst of the beautiful light was a tiny, enchantingly beautiful human shaped girl. But she was only three inches tall. He was amazed, full of wonder and overjoyed because he thought this must be the answer to my prayers. I've been sent a child. I was meant to find her. This is where I do my work. This is meant to be. And so he took the tiny girl out of the bamboo and brought her home to raise as his daughter. His wife was just as happy. And to protect the beautiful tiny girl, she placed her in a basket to keep her safe. The old couple were just so happy and full of love and adoration for the child and they showered her with affection and care. And it happened that as the days went on, the bamboo cutter started to find treasure hidden in the bamboo. It started with pieces of gold that he would find in the knots after he cut down the stalks. And then he started to find gems, precious jewels. And slowly, over time, he became a wealthy, wealthy man. He had a new splendid home built and his family lived in great comfort. Three months went by and the tiny three inch tall girl grew into a full statured woman. Her new foster parents dressed her up in the finest kimonos and did up her hair in the most beautiful styles. And she was so extraordinarily beautiful that they put her behind screens like a princess did not allow anyone to see her. Throughout this time, she continued to glow and she always had this soft, gentle light coming from her that lit up the house. And just being in her presence made any sadness disappear. Now it came time for the naming day of the girl. And so the foster parents called in a very well-known and celebrated name giver. This name giver gave the girl the name Kaguya Hime, meaning princess of moonlight because it appeared to him with the way that she glowed that she was very well a daughter of the moon god. To celebrate her naming, the couple held a three day long feast and invited all of their friends and relatives. And all those who saw Kaguya Hime said that she was the most beautiful woman in all of the land. 
It didn't take long for rumors of her beauty to start to spread, and soon the entire house was surrounded by potential suitors. Many men wanted a chance to marry her, and some still just wanted to see her. They were hoping that they could just catch a glimpse. Some even cut holes in the fence with the hope of seeing her walk from room to room. This group watched day and night, but when no one could catch a glimpse of her, they went to the old couple and asked for a chance to see her. But the old couple refused. And as time went on, more and more of the men became discouraged, left the house, until finally there were only five knights remaining. These knights stayed standing at the gate day and night, no matter the weather, not sleeping, eating only what little food was brought to them by others. They stayed there throughout the harshness of winter, the beauty of spring, and again, the burning sun of summer. Throughout all this time, determined to get a chance to speak with Kaguya Hime. They tried writing her poetry and letters, expressing their love and devotion, but they never got word that she so much as read them. She certainly did not reply. They begged the bamboo cutter to allow them to see Kaguya Hime, but finally he came out and told them, I'm only her foster father. I cannot force her to do anything. And at hearing this, they finally returned to their homes. And there they prayed, hoping to find some way to get what they wanted to achieve their heart's desire. And in time, their feelings didn't go away. So each of them returned to the woodcutter's home. At seeing the knights return, the bamboo cutter went out to hear what they had to say. And they begged him to allow them to see her, or at least to tell her of their feelings, of how they waited through the winter and the summer, and they did not eat or sleep so strong was their devotion that all of this suffering would be seen as a joy if it meant they could just speak with her. Feeling a little bit of pity and kind of impressed by the dedication of these men, the bamboo cutter went inside to speak to his foster daughter. Inside, the bamboo cutter told Kaguya Hime that he and his wife had raised her as a daughter and showered her with love and affection, given her all she wanted and they had protected her, and he wanted to know if she would do what he asked. Kaguya Hime responded that there's nothing she wouldn't do for the woodcutter, even though he said that she was a divine being, that she very likely came from the moon with some kind of celestial entity. She didn't remember a time that was before her life with the woodcutter. She only knew her life with him and his wife that she loved. At her words, the bamboo cutter was very happy, and he told her it was his wish that she chose one of these five knights and that she married him. He wanted to be sure that she was taken care of and provided for. He was getting old, and he wanted to make sure that she was safe when he died. But this made Kaguya Hime pretty upset, and she said that she just didn't want to be married yet. He responded that because she was more than just a normal, mortal woman, it was fine for her to do whatever she wanted as long as he was there to take care of her and provide for her. But he wasn't going to live forever. And he was worried. When he was gone, who was going to take care of her? Then Kaguya Hime said she was worried. Maybe she wasn't as beautiful as all the rumors said. And that these knights had just fallen in love with the idea of her beauty. What if they saw her and changed their mind? They didn't know her not her as a person. And this made sense to the woodcutter. He agreed that her reasoning was sound, but he also said, if this dedication that they have shown you is not enough for you to even talk to them, what else do you want? What other trials do they have to pass to prove that they're devoted to you? And so she said that she would meet each of them, but only after they undertook a task she would give each of them something that they had to go find and bring back to her. And at that time, she would meet with them. That very night, the bamboo cutter went out to the five knights, and he was a little wary because he knew the message he delivered was not going to be easy. Upon hearing that the princess had requested that they each go out and find something, the knights agreed. They thought this was a great idea. This would be a kind of fair way for each of them to 
get in to see her. They wouldn't have to compete with one another. They had an individual task. That was until they heard what they had to find. The first knight had to go to India and bring her Buddha's stone bowl. The second knight had to go to the mountain of Horai in the eastern sea and bring her a branch from a tree that grew at the top. This tree had silver roots, a golden trunk, and fruits of white jewels. The third knight had to go to China and bring her the skin of the fire rat. The fourth knight had to go and find the dragon that had a five-colored stone on its head and bring her the stone. And the fifth knight had to find the swallow that had a shell in its stomach and bring her the shell. When the knights heard of these tasks, they were dismayed and kind of angry, a little upset, because they thought that this was just her way of getting rid of them. These tasks sounded absolutely impossible. And, and when they left to go home, they were feeling hopeless. But like before, in time, at their own homes, their love for Kaguya-hime returned, and they decided they would set out on these quests. The first knight decided that instead of taking the long and dangerous journey to India, he was going to go to Kyoto, and he found a temple there where there was a stone bowl that he bought for a great sum of money from a priest. He took the bowl, wrapped it up in a beautiful golden cloth, and then stayed in Kyoto for three years, at which time he returned and presented the bowl to the bamboo cutter. The bamboo cutter took the bowl to Kaguya-hime, and she was surprised to hear that it had only taken three years for him to go to India and back. And when she took the bowl and opened it up out of the cloth, it did not glow like it was supposed to, and she knew immediately that it was fake. So the first night failed his task. The second night left home telling his family that he needed to change his environment to improve his health. He was too embarrassed to tell them the truth that he was going on a quest for the love of Kaguya-hime. After a while, he also had all of his attendants with him turn around and go back, so that he alone went to the seashore. From there, he hired a ship and sailed for three days. Upon making landfall, he hired a group of carpenters to build a very unique house that no one could get into, assumably once they were inside and closed the door. Otherwise, you know, how'd they get in? He then hired six skilled jewelers, took the jewelers and himself and locked them all up inside of the house. There he told them to set about creating a silver branch that looked like it would have come from the tree atop Mount Horai. He had made the decision to do this essentially because everyone that he had come across told him that the island of Mount Horai was a legend. It wasn't real. And so he thought this was the only way to do what the princess wanted. Once the branch was complete, he put it into a fancy lacquered box and then returned to the home of the bamboo cutter. Seeing that the knight's clothes were all disheveled and he looked like he had literally just returned from a great journey, the bamboo cutter was excited, thinking he, he did it. He really did. And he brought the box to Kaguya-hime. Unfortunately, however, upon receiving the box, Kaguya-hime said, there's no way he made it all the way to Mount Horai and back in such a short amount of time. And this branch looks man-made. It's not real. So the bamboo cutter went back outside and asked the second knight where he had gotten the branch. On the spot, the knight made up a great story of his trials and tribulations at having gotten the branch. He said that he had hired a ship and then sailed to the sea. The ship had then been in a great storm and wrecked upon an island full of demons who tried to eat him, but he persuaded them to help fix the ship instead. And so he kept going until one day he found a great mountainous island. And when he made it to the shore, a shining figure appeared and told him that he had made it to Mount Horai. He had then climbed up to the top of the mountain and gotten his branch. And despite that he wanted to stay on this mystical island and see all that was there, he had been so determined to get back quickly that he came straight back. It had taken 500 days to find it and 400 days to return home. And now he was there 
as he finished this miraculous story, the jewelers appeared because they had not been paid. And they demanded that Kaguya-hime pay them for the work of creating the silver branch. Upon hearing that he was a great big liar, she happily paid the jewelers a good sum of money and sent the second knight away in shame. On his way home, he found the jewelers and beat them nearly to death for revealing his lie. But then he withdrew from society completely, became a hermit up in the mountains. And so the second knight failed his task. Now, the third knight needed a fire rat from China. This was an animal whose body was supposed to be completely impervious to fire. And instead of going to China to try to find this creature, instead he wrote to a friend of his who happened to live in China. And he told this friend that he would pay him whatever sum of money the friend wanted if he could bring him a fire rat. So in time, his friend caught the fire rat and sailed to Japan. The third knight rode for seven days straight to meet his friend at his ship, and then immediately took the skin straight to the bamboo cutter's house. Once again, the bamboo cutter presented Kaguya Hime with what the knight had brought. And to test it, she tossed it into the fire. The hide immediately burned away to a crisp. And so the third knight failed his task. The fourth knight, similarly to the third, decided he was not even going to try to go out looking for the dragon with the five colored stone on its head. Instead, he sent out all of his servants, told them that they had to go find the dragon and they could not return until they did. Thinking similarly to what their Lord did, the servants thought this was a ridiculous task. It was impossible. So instead of even trying, they just took a bit of a vacation. They traveled around together to beautiful lands and just kind of complained about the stupid thing that their boss was having them do. Back at home, however, the fourth knight was so confident that he would be successful, he had his entire home remodeled and had it decorated to be worthy of a princess. A year passed and none of his servants had returned. So getting very impatient and a little desperate, the fourth knight went off on his own search. He hired a ship and demanded that the captain find the dragon with the five colored stone. But similarly to the servants, the captain and the crew told him, this is ridiculous. We're not doing that. He managed to pay them enough to get them to at least set sail. Only a few days had passed before a terrible storm hit the ship. And this storm lasted so long that by the time it was over, the fourth night had decided he was done. This was enough. He was giving up. They made landfall and he took to bed. He had gotten sick during this storm. In time, he began to rest at the local governor's house and his love for Kaguya Hime became anger. He was mad at her for having sent him on this ridiculous quest. And he believed that she actually had done this so that he would die because she knew that this was impossible. So when his servants returned, to their surprise, he wasn't mad. He was actually kind of happy. He told them, welcome back. This was a dumb thing we tried to do. I'm done, I give up. And so the fourth knight failed his task. And all we know of the fifth knight is that he could not find the swallow with the shell in its belly. And so the fifth knight also failed his task. Now, over the expanse of time that these knights were trying to undertake their tasks, word of Kaguya Hime and her beauty and the devotion of these knights reached the ears of the emperor. And so the emperor had one of his ladies-in-waiting, one of the ladies of the court, go to the bamboo cutter's home to find out if she really was as beautiful as the rumor said. When the court lady arrived, Kaguya Hime refused to see her even though her foster father begged and they were told this is not an option. This is order of the emperor. Kagegehime still refused. She said that if she was forced to obey the emperor's desires, his summons to meet this court lady, then she would disappear from the earth. And that's the message that the court lady had to take back to the emperor. 
and upon hearing this, he was even more determined to see her. So the emperor planned a hunting trip that just so happened to be near the home of the bamboo cutter. He sent word to the bamboo cutter, letting him know of this plan. And the bamboo cutter responded that he received this information and he agreed with the emperor's plans. So during this hunt, the emperor slipped away from his group and went straight to the bamboo cutter's home. He went right inside and straight to Kaguya Hime's door. When he saw her and the glorious light that she emitted, he was rooted in place. He was astonished, dazzled by her beauty, and he immediately fell deeply in love with her. Soon, however, Kaguya Hime realized she was being watched. She tried to run, escape from the room, but he grabbed her and he begged her to listen to what it was that he had to say. She didn't answer, just buried her head in her sleeves. He then told her that her beauty belonged in the palace. She needed to come back to court with him. She couldn't keep hiding herself away in the middle of nowhere in this home. And he was about to order one of his palaquins come in for her, but before he could, she stopped him. She said that if he ordered her to come back to his court, if he forced her against her will to leave her home, she would fade away and become a shadow. Right before his very eyes, she started to disappear. In desperation, he promised that he would not make her leave. As long as she stayed in her form, she did not disappear, he would leave her alone. And so she agreed, and he left. The emperor returned sadly to the palace, but he found that no one could measure up to the light and the splendor of Kaguyahime. Everyone else compared to her looked dull, and he just could not get her out of his mind. He sent her poetry expressing his deep, ardent love, but she still refused to see him. She did, however, write back. She wrote her own poetry in which she explained kindly that she would never marry any man while she was on earth, and her words did make him at least a little bit happy. It was not long after this incident with the emperor that the bamboo cutter and his wife started to notice that at night, Kaguya Hime would sit out on her balcony and stare sadly up at the moon. She would do this for hours and hours, and at the end, she would always burst out in tears. One night, her foster father found her weeping so hard and so desperately that he begged her to tell him what was wrong. Through her tears, Kaguya Hime told him that he had been correct. She was not a mortal woman. She had come from the moon, and soon her time on earth would be at an end. On the 15th of that very month of August, the people of the moon would come for her, and she would have to return. But this made her desperately sad, because she didn't remember her life on the moon. All she knew was her loving life here with the bamboo cutter and his wife, and she did not want to leave. Upon learning this, her foster parents and her attendants were all just devastated, and there was a great sadness over the home. It wasn't too long before the emperor received word about this, and he sent his own messengers to determine if it was true, if Kaguya Hime was really leaving the world. Captain, is that your leg? Sometimes I think he's not of this world. Oh. When the messenger arrived at the bamboo cutter's home, the bamboo cutter confirmed the moon people would be coming for Kaguya Hime, but that he planned on taking them captive when they arrived, of keeping the people of the moon prisoner, because it was the only way he could think of to keep Kaguya Hime safe from them. With this information, the messenger returned home and told the emperor. On the 15th of that month, the day that Kaguya Hime was supposed to be taken, the emperor sent 2,000 trained archers to protect her home. 1,000 of them were stationed on the roof and the other half around the home, guarding all the entrances and exits. The bamboo cutter ordered every single person in the house to stay awake all night and be ready to defend the home and protect Kaguya Hime. Sadly, though, she told him, 
none of this would work. None of the men would be able to stop the people of the moon from coming and taking her. She told him again that this isn't what she wanted. She wanted to stay with him, but there was nothing anyone could do to stop it. The night went on and the yellow harvest moon rose. Everyone in the house waited for the people of the moon to appear. As the hours dragged by though, dawn started to lighten the sky to gray and a little bit of hope began to stir that maybe the people of the moon weren't coming. Suddenly, a cloud appeared to form around the moon and it began to float down towards the earth. They hoped and hoped that it wasn't coming for the bamboo cutter's house, but soon enough, they couldn't deny that it was. The cloud floated right down to the earth and stopped above the ground. On the cloud was a group of heavenly glowing creatures and in the center was a flying chariot from which emerged a kingly looking man. And this man called to the bamboo cutter asking him to come out. The bamboo cutter went outside to meet this man and the man told him, I have come for Kaguya Hime. She is a princess of the moon. Back home, she committed a grave crime and her sentence was to spend time on earth. But now that sentence is over and it is time for her to return home. But the bamboo cutter said he had raised Kaguya Hime for 20 years and never once has she done a single thing wrong. So this woman they were looking for, it couldn't be her and he begged them to leave and go find their princess somewhere else. But the heavenly being instead called directly to Kaguya Hime, telling her to come out. It was time to go home. And so Kaguya Hime came outside. She saw how devastated her foster father was and again told him that it was not her wish to leave. She would stay if she could. She told her foster father that he should always think of her when he looks up at the moon. And then she took off her outer garment, a beautiful embroidered piece of clothing and gave it to him to remember her by. Now in this chariot was the elixir of life in a bottle. And this was given to Kaguya Hime to drink before she was taken up back to the moon. She drank a little bit of this potion and wanted to give the rest to the old man, but they didn't let her, she was stopped. Right as they were about to put a celestial robe of feathers over her, Kaguya Hime told the people of the moon to stop. She had one last thing she needed to do before she left, and that was to write a goodbye to the emperor. And so, despite their impatience, Kaguya Hime made the people of the moon wait while she wrote a letter to the emperor. She then rolled up the potion within the letter and gave it to the old bamboo cutter asking him to deliver it to the emperor. With that, the heavenly cloak was placed upon Kaguya Hime and the cloud began to rise back into the sky. All the people of the house watched with tears in their eyes as she began to float away. As she reached the sky, dawn broke and her cloud was lost amid the brightening sky. The letter was taken to the emperor, but he was afraid to touch or mess with the elixir of life. So he had both the bottle and the letter taken to the top of the most sacred mountain, Mount Fuji. At the top, at sunrise, he had both the letter and the bottle burned. To this day, some say they still see the smoke rising at sunrise from the top of Mount Fuji towards the heavens. And that was the story of the bamboo cutter and the moon child. It's such an interesting tale to me because because it's both happy and sad. And it has so many elements to it that seem very familiar to me as a Western reader of this tale. The idea of a realm apart that kind of swaps out children immediately reminded me of the fairy realm and changelings. The idea of having humans raise a child, but she wasn't really a child. She was sent to the earth as a kind of punishment, which then immediately made me think of the movie Pan's Labyrinth, which if you ever want a good cry, that's a beautiful movie, but similar situation in which a kind of divine princess was sent to the mortal realm almost as a, as a punishment. No, actually, did she run away? Oh, I have to look that up now. Mm, I don't remember now if she ran away or if it was a punishment, but I know that she goes back to the end. She had forgotten her family, same as Kaguya Hime. 
And it's, it's a sad thing to think that she had to leave the old bamboo cutter and his wife, especially because they loved her so much and she loved them. And true that they now have lots of wealth and they can, you know, never work again in their lives, but they, they wanted their daughter. They wanted her to stay with them. And it's interesting that they didn't get to have her until the end of their lives. They had to say goodbye to her. Let me know what you think about that. Do you think it was a blessing for them to get to meet her and love her and have her, but then lose her? Or was it more of a curse to experience that joy and then lose her? I don't know. I'm not a mother of, of human children, so I can't speak to that, but I'm curious as to what you think. Anyway, the story of Kaguya Hime has been adapted into countless works. We're talking poetry, songs, novels, short stories, manga, anime, and interestingly, an episode of Sesame Street. I believe it was called Big Bird Goes to Japan. And more recently, a 2013 Studio Ghibli movie. Love Studio Ghibli. The film was called The Tale of Princess Kaguya. While I was researching this story, I found a lot of references to some modern scholars determining that this story is a very early piece of, well, science fiction as a category didn't exist at the time that this was written, obviously, but that modern scholars consider it to be kind of like an early sci-fi story. But the majority of what I saw and what I personally agree with is that the people of the moon in this story aren't aliens. It's not like a sci-fi-esque spaceship came down for her. It's more of a spiritual thing. The people of the moon live in a spiritual realm apart, or just a world apart really, but is more full of magic, similarly to the fairy world. But it is interesting to think of it as a kind of science fiction-esque story of the people of the moon being, I guess, like an alien race that come down for Kaguya, their lost princess. During the period that this story was likely originally developed, the Heian period, it was common for aristocrats to hold moon viewing parties. The moon has always been a symbol of great importance to most cultures. And in Japan, it was tied directly to enlightenment. And in some sects of Taoism, also tied to immortality, which would then relate back to the elixir of life, that potion. I'm not super well versed on Buddhism or Taoism, so I can't really speak to the true significance of the moon and what it might mean in this story. I'm just giving you kind of an overview of what I found when I was looking it up. Overall, for me, it is so interesting to see a story that is structured in a way that gives the impression, at least to me, that it's going to be a romance. It's going to be a, you know, prince and a princess tale or a princess and the emperor in this case. At the beginning, I thought it was going to be a princess and one of the knights that, you know, one of them would succeed, but it doesn't end up being that. And it makes me wonder if it's not possible for a celestial being to marry a mortal or if just in this case, Kaguya Hime had no desire to marry one and she has the autonomy to make that happen, in which case, yeah, that's awesome. I wish more princesses who didn't want to get married had the option to just say, no, I'm going to disappear if you make me. That's great. <laughs> but it's just interesting because in the types of stories that I typically read, if the story is set up for there to be a wedding, there's going to be a wedding. So it's, it's just interesting to see a story in which that doesn't happen. And I am excited to potentially look more into Japanese folk tales, legends, fairy tales. I know more about Japanese folklore than I do about tales, but there was a lot of requests to do something that was non-Eurocentric and I was more than happy to do that. So more stories from Japan and other non-Eurocentric countries are coming. If this is a story that you heard growing up or have heard since then, I guess, please let me know what you thought of my telling of it. If you can give any insights into more meanings that I missed, I'm sure I missed things. And just in general, what you thought. Again, I keep coming back to whether or not this was a blessing for the couple. I want to think that it was because the joy of her being in their lives was worth the suffering of losing her. But I'm kind of wondering what the story wants us to think about that. And it's a little unclear for me. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed 
spending some time with me here today. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you next week. I'm so sorry for Captain grooming himself in the background. Hope that doesn't bother you. Yes, I'm talking about you. Thank you.